Hey, welcome back, guys. This is Golden Aesthetics and Artemis. Today is a very special episode. Today we're here with uh, the legend himself, Frank Zane, three-time Mr. Olympia, Mr. Universe, Mr. World, Mr. America. I'm very excited and honored to be uh, shared this time with you, Zane. Thanks, thank you so much for letting us film this. It's, it's, it's a huge honor, and I'm sure the guys up there will definitely enjoy some of your knowledge. Thank you. um, I have a couple questions here that everybody was asking me, and uh, majority of the people uh, were interested, what age did you start bodybuilding? Well, I was 14, uh, so that I'm almost 73 now, so that's almost 50, 60 years. What was the, the major reason for you to start to get in sport? I just felt the need to do something individual rather than team sports so much. I mean, I tried team sports, but I really felt like I could do a better job if I did it myself, and I was right. Bodybuilding was perfect for me. So who introduced you to bodybuilding? How did you? I saw that? pictures in the magazines. I, That's I how everybody used to backdate magazine shop and get these magazines. I saw these guys, then I started reading about it, studying it, trying the routines, bought a set of dumbbells, worked out. Now, why did you decide to compete? What age? 17. 17, so it's been three years after you started? Uh -huh. How was your first contest? Uh, first contest was uh, uh, an open novice contest with 50 people in it. And I placed fifth, which was encouraging, especially because Bob Hoffman was there. You know, those days, it was weightlifting all day, Olympic weightlifting, and that night was the, the physique contest. Mm -hmm. And Hoffman was backstage watching me pump up. And he came over to me and he said, young man, if I had a physique like yours, I'd walk around with my shirt off all the time. <laughs> and right then I knew that I could be great. I mean, it's funny, right. when you hear things like that, and it's what you needed yeah. to hear to keep going. And yeah, I get show, those sometimes too. <laughs> A couple months later, I, I placed third in Teenage Mr. America on my first trophy. How about, um, what do you think about bodybuilding today? What, how do you see it today? And what the difference is between golden era bodybuilding and the bodybuilding that is on stage right now? Well, bodybuilding, I like the, I like the process of creating something new, of developing your body, changing it, make, having it look the way you would really like it to look. And maybe some of these people today in bodybuilding really want to look like that because that's the look they're portraying. I, personally, not to my taste. I don't like it. I wouldn't want to be like that. Most people I talk to that come to me as clients don't either. That's why they come to see me. In a way, uh, they've, the bodybuilders of today have provided a marked contrast to my physique. It's very different. It's just overdone. It's mass produced. It's like assembly line. just crank out those, those machines. They all look the same. They're done quick. They're done quick. They're done in a couple years. Yes. That's the thing about bodybuilding with me is I've done it my whole life. I didn't, I, I, I didn't win the Olympia until my, I think it was my 10th try, my seventh try, something like that. Not, nothing was right away. Everything took me a long time, but I stuck with it. So I developed perseverance. It wasn't anything that happened overnight. You know, it's a quick gratification. So. I, I, I loved it and uh, I still do, I still do it. Uh, what do you think about aesthetics and what defines aesthetic body? Because you're at the definition, every, that's somebody, if somebody's talking about aesthetics, it means they're talking about Frank Zane. How do you see it in your own words? How did you create what you thought is gonna be what you are right now? Well, I had my what idols that I, I mean, wanted to, to look like, Steve Reeves primarily and then later on Larry Scott and got to know them too. That's one thing about I, I love about my career is I, I met everybody and I trained with a lot of them too. So I have the experience of, of that. But uh, <clears throat> aesthetics, I think, is basically, what is your aesthetic? You hear that referred to like in fashion shows a lot. What, what's your aesthetic? I mean, how do you like things to look? Mm -hmm. My aesthetic would be characterized as symmetry and proportion, uh, not overly big, uh, good lines to the body, uh, postures of excellence in, in, in posing. And the way I developed it was by taking tons of photos over the years. I never relied on numbers. I was a mathematics yeah. teacher. I, never I have affinity for numbers, but I don't rely on them because they're not reality. They're a measurement of, of reality. You go in a contest, what's important? How you look, what do they do? They look at you, so I figured, why don't I just focus on that? This other stuff doesn't mean anything, how much you weigh, what you measure, it's what it looks like. And so I got many, many, many photos, especially when I was preparing for competition, and I saw what needed to be done and what was there. So when I got on stage, I knew what I looked like and I could 
I could push that to the audience. I could project that. The worst thing is going into a show and not knowing what you look like. You'll find out at the show. Yeah, because Even majority of the majority of people right now are my biceps is twenty, my this is that, but you, nobody really measures your biceps when you go on stage. Nobody cares about everybody looks and they just look at, at the symmetry and how pleasing it is. Nobody really cares about huge biceps. It's about developing your body to the extent that it displays well, that it can create an illusion. That's the thing, is you gotta create an illusion on stage of looking phenomenal. I mean you do, but under different lighting, of course, you can look different. Yes. You know, you don't win the show. Whoever is the biggest walking into the contest with their street clothes on doesn't win it. <laughs> it's, it's who wins it under the lights. It's under the lights that matter. Why, why do you think that the training methods of today are so much more, I mean, advertised a lot more, and they say they're going to make you grow better and more, and then you shouldn't be looking at the you know, training of the golden era bodybuilders because they were over training, they were doing too much. And nowadays it's that, you know, people are talking about more weights, they got to train heavier. So what, what is your, t what's your take on that? You know, it all, there's a way to do pretty much everything with weights and bodybuilding and diet and everything. It's, it's what you want to do. You know, it's, it's uh, what appeals to you. Uh, so I, I just go by that. This is what appeals to me. And plus I have to be honest with you. I couldn't get that big. I mean, I realized that wasn't my forte. I mm -hmm. When I bet I was going to be something bigger than me. Very small bone structure. It's good bone structure for bodybuilding. Small hips, wide shoulders, small joints. But, you know, it muscles look bigger. You know, when you have a six and a half inch wrist, your arms are going to look bigger than somebody with an eight inch wrist, no matter how big they are. So I just, I went by that and just stuck with it. Just kept, kept at it, kept at it. What, what kind of nutrition? Um, were you staying on something the same over the years or something that you, you found worked for you and you just stayed on it or yes. you changed nutrition? Yes, I found nutrition? work stayed with it. And it was basically the high protein, uh, low car not a real low carbohydrate diet, but not as much pro carbs as protein and a moderate fat to low fat diet. And so I'd always get around 100, about a gram of protein per pound of body weight this is what I do now. I mm -hmm. mean, then I got more protein than that when I was competing. Uh, half, half that amount in fat and carbs. So if I was getting 200 grams of protein, it would be 100 grams of carbs. Enough for energy purposes, but enough to also to introduce ketosis maybe after a couple of days and then pull myself out of it. So that's basically what I would do. Keep the carbs low, the protein high for a few days in a row, get into ketosis and pull back out, restore glycogen. How, how did your cardio look like throughout the year? Let's say you were in the off season. Or you're still sticking to the cardio because a lot of guys, when they're off season, they do zero cardio. I absolutely. was some. Uh, now it's informal. Now I walk a couple times a week with my dog, mm -hmm. like mile and a half, three times a week. I ride a stationary bike. I do rowing machine and a little treadmill. But in the off season, it's probably well, even with the dog walking, it's about an hour and a half a week of aerobics, two hours. That's about all I usually do. If I if I want to get in really shape, I found that three hours a week of intense aerobics does it for me. So when you go on, let's say, in a, into a competition preparations and, and contest yes. shape, you go a lot more in the cardio? Not a lot more, just the right amount. Okay. The best shape I was ever in, I think, was for the 79 Olympia. And preparing for that, I was in isolation in Palm Springs for the last month, and I ran a mile and a half every night when the temperature dropped below 100 mm -hmm. on the track. And it, my legs got incredible doing that, just running, you know, eight mile, eight minute mile. Yeah, you could. I never had to do a lot of cardio. It was always sort of on, I was always on the lean side. I was never fat. Did you, um, when you started training, did you start with more power lifting base, heavier weights? For and a while. Then, and then transition into um, more of isolations because, uh, you yes. know, a lot of, there's a lot of speculations of that right now. It's saying, people say bodybuilding is an isolation sport and you can actually you know, grow your physique without going too heavy or you would recommend for people that just come into the sport, you know, to start a little heavier on a, on a part. It all depends. See, when you're talking about the truth, if you want to grow mass, you have to train with heavy weights. The body uh, muscles actually have to interpret this as being heavier. You could do a little bit more of that with a sensible weight by slowing down the negatives, for example, doing things like drop sets. You get a lot out of that. But um, the thing is with the heavy weights, um, 
If you're training heavy and going heavier and heavier and heavier, basically, and you're trying to gain weight and get bigger, what gets bigger is muscles in the central part of the body, the, the central muscles, thighs, butt, waist, pecs, traps. These muscles don't give you a symmetrical look. They give you a chunky, blocky look. Larry Scott told me this. This is really astute when he told me this. If you really want to get what people call symmetry in bodybuilding, work the peripheral muscles harder and get them to grow. Your forearms, your calves, your deltoids, your lat spread, small waist. Look at the silhouette. The silhouette. That's what you, that's what you have to look at is the silhouette. Did they do that in shows? No. Why not? That shows overall balance. Yes. Look at your outline. That's yes. what people see. Yes. Unconsciously, they perceive that the outline. Something like that. That's that looks scary. It does. I, I totally agree with you. Uh, well, um, a, a lot of people asking about vacuums. It's something that you don't see anymore on bodybuilding stage. Um, you know, you see more of a gut and you know big stomachs. It's hard to do it. With it yeah, phrase, yeah, so. absolutely. That's um, full of food. How was how was the back in the day? How how people were eating or how how was the vacuum training? Was something involved in every single day exercising? What, no. what kind of... Uh, basically, the, the, there's a need for that when you're posing for your front shots because let's say you do front double bicep. Uh, you could either do it with a vacuum or with abs because if you don't, you're going to have some, not, nothing happening in the center part of your, your body. You have to show detail everywhere. Mm -hmm. Abs do that. I mean, look at the great ab shots you have with the double bicep. Mm -hmm. Vacuum does that too. Like Arnold never did, uh, he didn't have much in the way of abs. I mean, he no. did some. But he would do his front double bicep with a vacuum. He looked he had a great vacuum. Yeah. Mike Pence had a good vacuum too. Yes, absolutely. Bill Pearl had a good vacuum. They did dumbbell pullovers across the bench. Arnold did it, but those guys did. I did. That's how I got it. That's a lot of pullovers. Lying over the bench. And you're sucking your stomach while you're holding the dumbbell overhead. Well actually that part of it came from practicing the pose pretty mm -hmm. much, pulling in the stomach. You gotta be hungry. And I had a, a, a method that I, I, I found myself I didn't say, I'm going to do this. I just found myself doing it. As the contest got closer, mm -hmm. what I found myself doing was staying hungry longer. Not eating every hour, every two hours. Just staying hungry longer. And then I would vacuum. Mm -hmm. I also would play instru wind instruments, too, like I'm a harmonica player. I would do that. You play better <laughs> when you're hungry. You do. The worse yes. you feel, the better you play. That's what the blues is all about. <laughs> so I would practice it, you know, and as part of my posing routine. I put a lot of time in on posing. Do you think practice, like practicing vacuums also help to keep your waistline smaller and yes. tighter? Yeah. Anytime you tense your abs, you know, you're, you're doing something for it in that manner. But I did a lot of ab work too. You don't say you're, you know, people say, oh, if you do a lot of ab work, because now, nowadays bodybuilders don't do much of ab work for some reason. But um, they're saying, oh, if you do too much abs and too much exercises in your core, your, your waist is going to grow. What do you think of that? Depends what you do. If you do sit-ups with a 50-pound plate, yeah, it's going to grow, especially the upper abs attached to the ribcage, and you'll have a protruding weight. Mm -hmm. But if you load up with 10,000 calories a day and squat real heavy, you know, your waist is going to grow too. I mean, there's a lot of ways to make your waist grow. And that's one thing I didn't like about my physique is when I got heavier, there was a year that everybody told me I, I need to get bigger, need to get bigger. So in 1982, I did. I wanted to weigh 200 for the, comp for the Olympia. And I did, and I lost. And I looked at the photos. I was too smooth. My waist was bigger. If, if I were 10 pounds less, I would look way better, way better. You're you probably one of these in your mind. You, you probably one of the lightest Mr. Olympia ever. Well, yeah, hundred, well, you wanted what, 192 pounds? Let's see, first year, I think I was what, 187, 77, 185 in, in 88, in 78. That's amazing. And 191. And when I won it the third time. <laughs> this guy's right now at 280, 260 pounds on stage, 240. Crazy. It's all a matter of taste. Yes. And absolutely. there's no accounting for taste. So I can't say that's bad. I mean, that's what they like. And there's people that like that too. A handful of them. There's not many of them. I mean, less and less as time goes on. But what do you what think, they want to do. Where do you think it's going to go? I don't know. I'm waiting to see. I try to do my small part, but, uh, you know... Uh, Things are the way they are. I mean, it's, there's powerful sources advocating things that I don't agree with, so. I just hope that people, you know, I, I'm, I'm, around, I'm gonna be doing this for a while, teaching people mm -hmm. here at my facility. 
I just hope that they're interested enough to come and see me if they really want to make some progress because I can really help them. So I here, guys, you can find Frank Zane on his website. What's your website? FrankZane.com. FrankZane.com. And if you guys want an experience with the best of the best, the legend, it's, he's right here. He's an awesome facility. He can definitely help you out. Um, I would do that. I would learn better from the king than read some articles in muscle and fitness or articles in bodybuilding.com. You're going to do it. You know? Yeah, of course. I am You're down. You're training to do it. I am already <laughs> in. I'm in. Uh, I have a question about supplements, something that um, a lot of people are speculating about nowadays. Uh, there was not a lot of supplements back in, in your age, right, where the golden era was? And there was, actually. How, what kind of supplements you personally relied on when you were training? As when I came to California in 1969, everybody, I mean, not everybody, but the people who knew, that the top people, were using Real Blair's products. I don't know if you've heard of Real Blair. This what is it? Well, he had a milk and egg protein. His first one really get into amino acids free form amino acids. Mm -hmm. It's way ahead of his time. I mean, we were taking glutamine in 1970, mega dosing and taking, you know, mega vitamin, not so much mega vitamin theory, but mega everything, a lot of amino acids. And I still rely on that. I've been taking free form amino acids for the last 45 years. And I think it does a lot, a lot. Because everything is amino acids, yeah. neurotransmitters, hormones, muscle. So nowadays you walk into GNC and they offer you a whole spectrum of stuff that's going to make you grow and promise you an, an amazing gains, you know, like there's names like Jack 3D or like a lot of pre-workout stuff that I think really affecting the body and make your digestion slower and damages your metabolism, makes you bloat and affects your nervous system. And people rely on the pre-workouts a lot nowadays. They say, oh, I can't last without it. I can't do anything without it. Were there any type of pre-workouts? while you were training? Coffee. That's the best thing. <laughs> I do coffee and almonds. A little bit. Uh, I, you know, I, you, I always look at who's saying it. You know, if, if, if the person is saying it to me as an example of what they're, they're talking about, then maybe there's something to it. But you know, I mean, if a person is talking to me right in the face and he has bad, really bad breath, I'm not gonna believe anything he says. That's sort of symbolic, but that's the yeah, point. Yeah, I understand. You know, I mean, uh, physician heal thyself. I learned as a teacher that what really matters is not what you say, it's who you are, what you do, your behavior and who you are. And I found out years later, students that I ran across, like 20 years after the fact, they said, that because they learned a lot of math from me, but because I was Mr. Universe teaching high school. Mm -hmm. That's why. And they looked up to that, because I was an example of, of you know, what I taught. What are you, um, what's your outtake on genetics and how, it, does it really define the level of aesthetics you can reach? Or aesthetics is something you can build within any genetic code or any built? You, become, you can become more aesthetic if you just concentrate on certain things in your training. And uh, I have a new a book, my latest book called Let's Grow. It's, it's not about bulking up, it's about selective growth in body parts by your form in the exercise form, the movement, everything, it's just a lot to it. You have to learn to isolate to get certain muscles to respond after a while. I mean, at first you might want to gain some weight and grow, especially if you have, you know, your thing here and here. That's, that is useful at that time, but it's not what you do all the time thereafter. You change according to what you look like and what you want to look. So you do believe that you can achieve yeah. really eye-pleasing body within any, any, absolutely any build? The, absolute, the level to which I don't know, mm -hmm. but everybody can get more of that. Absolutely. A lot of people will give up on themselves and say, oh, I don't have what it takes. I have white bones, but I do think and believe that you can look better. A lot better. of people did. A lot of people did. Larry Scott didn't have a, a big, big tape. He st still got to be the best. Yeah. Who is your favorite bodybuilder of all times besides yourself? Steve. Steve. Uh, very natural. Very natural, so I, I think I like all the guys of, the, of the, the past generation that have all that passed away. Bill Pearl, the last one now, because they're the ones that founded the sport. They're the ones that started old school. I mean, they did. That's, that, those training methods are still doing now, and they work. So we're not looking around for any kind of new stuff. I mean, I like machines and everything. I mean, you can see this gym. I have a lot of apparatus yeah. in here. I like that stuff, but there's a way to use it. So it's all about common sense and then getting feedback on the results of what you're doing. I but, think the feedback's very important, and that's where the photos come in. Um, what is your, the 
would be the best source of protein after training? And what's, what's the best thing to take after training? I think any, whatever kind of protein you like, I, 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 a lot of people use whey protein. I think that you can get too much. I, I know with me, it doesn't work as well because I used it so much over the years. I was really brought up drinking milk and there's a point in your life where you can't you get intolerant to it. So I rely on, on protein from egg white. I have an egg white protein with glutamine. And then I also just started a new, a new product called, calling it XYP because it's a vegan protein made from peas, mm -hmm. which it's very tasty. I use it for flavoring. I have someone to let you taste that. Oh, well, definitely. But that's what I use. There's more, I've been reading a lot and I've been doing a lot of, of it myself about red meat. And a lot of, there's a lot of bodybuilders like Arnold, he's a big advocate of, of eating a lot of red meat. What was your on take I on was that? too. I grew from eating red meat. I used a lot of steak. Don't eat it anymore. You know, my goals now are to build big muscles so much uh, as the last and, and anything that makes me feel uncomfortable. Like what, what, the thing about red meat is it's got connective tissue and it goes through you very slow and it gets stuck in there. Yes. It's easy to constipate eating a lot of red meat. So I don't need it. I, I basically rely on, on fish and turkey. They have very light sources and they go through your body very quickly and you'd feel lighter. They don't hang up. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. What, uh, and the last question will be your advice to people that just started lifting or people that just come into bodybuilding and want to compete. What would be your ultimate advice to absolutely anybody trying to build a static body? Well, best, that's the reason I wrote my books and published my literature is that because I tell it like it is and how I've done it. What I write is what I've done and what I'm doing. So I'd say if you want to know more about that and know more about how I was, what I did to be successful, get my literature. Uh, otherwise, you're on your own. Find a good trainer. I mean, you, a lot of times you, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm fortunate in my life that I, I, I ran into a lot of people along the way and I learned a lot from all of them. Each one contributed. There's some things that I didn't need to know. Yeah, we all learn. Too. We all learn from your image. Yeah. You, you know, just like you said, the picture says a, a lot more than the numbers. Sure. Um, so everybody, you know, there is a lot of a lot of fans out there. So you know, and everybody supports you, and everybody loves you, and you're a living legend, and you're the standard of aesthetics. Because if we talk about aesthetics, we're talking about Frank Zane. Oh, thank you. You know, you can you can find your picture absolutely in any bodybuilding profile, and this thing is gonna stay in the history. And I think you made history. You, you know, and you're gonna all, like you were an example for me. All my life, I was looking up to your image, and you changed in the way I perceive bodybuilding, and I look at it as art. art, art. Because uh, I think that's your, that's your thing. Because you look at your body and it's artistic. You, you know, it looks like it's an art, like it's an artwork. It's a masterpiece. Well, thank you. So congratulations on that, and thank you very much for sharing your time, your experience. Well, my pleasure. It's a great, a great happiness. To be <laughs> you know, um, guys, check out FrankZane.com. There is a lot of literature you can read. I'd rather you learn from the best. Um, I'm actually going to do the same thing. So thank you so much, Frank. Much pleasure meeting you. Thank a lot you. of honor, and I'm looking forward to sculpt the body like yours. You I mean, in, in my own, in my you're own. You're there already, in, in my own, in my own version, because I think we not, we can't look the same, but you can be the best for yourself within what you got. And I think this is like, oh, so, oh can I be like Frank Zane? Oh, can I be like Arnold? You will never gonna look like that. You have your own potential and you can look better because it's you. I'm very impressed with the photos I've seen of you and I wanna ask you a whole bunch of stuff, so. As soon as this is over, we're going to get into what's up for you. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely interested in talking about that. Okay. Thank you so much, Frank. Sure. Thank you. <laughs>